Good evening. It's good to be here. So I'm going to tell you what God did in my life, shockingly did in my life 13 and a half years ago, because, and then I'm going to get into some questions surrounding this issue, but 13 and a half years ago, I was a gay man living in Hollywood, and I was an atheist, and then I had this very unexpected encounter with God, and my whole life changed in a split second. But before I get to that, let's go back to the beginning. When I was very young, fifth or sixth grade, I I started to realize that I was attracted to the same sex, which is a strange phenomenon. It's very it's very unsettling when you're young and and you're it's like wait wait this isn't no one else around me is feeling this way, and 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 back in the day in the 80s it was very much frowned upon homosexuality was very taboo and very frowned upon especially growing up i grew up in dallas texas i was the youngest of eight kids at a very you know and according to my family my all of my siblings and my parents are all christians my my parents are in heaven right now praise god and according to my family my friend my classmates the culture at large Homosexual, homosexuality was forbidden. So I had to kind of live this sort of double life. It was kind of a schizophrenia. And so in, in, in elementary school and in high school, I, you know, I went study with girls and you know, I was very social, very you know, popular. But on the inside, I was having all of these feelings that I had to, these deep, dark secrets and I had to hide. But in high school, that all changed. When I was a junior, I met a sophomore and we became best friends. And a few months into our friendship, we came out to each other. I mean, we kind of knew already, but we had this, like we were out one night and we came out to each other and we, we basically confessed that we were both same sex attracted. So that once that happened, the floodgates just opened because we became partners in crime. And we started going to gay bars and to nightclubs. I mean, I was 15, he was 14. Not sure how we got into these clubs, but we did. And I remember this one, the first time I went to this nightclub, it was called the Stark Club. It was designed by Philippe Stark, the f- famous French designer. It was beautiful. It's really, really nice. And um, it was owned by Stevie Nicks and Grace Jones and some other people. And, I, and it, it was like a mix, of, it was, Straight people, gay people, drag queens, uh, transsexual people. It was a whole mix of people. And I remember walking in, and the first people I see are these two guys with shaved heads, and they are both wearing long robes, like priest robes, basically, and like big crucifix, giant crucifixes around their necks. I'm like, wow, these are this is my kind of place. And I, because I, I felt like, Internally, my whole life, I felt like a misfit. I didn't really fit because I was experiencing this stuff. And so I, I finally was like, these are my people. They are all kind of artists and myth, misfits, and, and they, get who, they get me. So that was a big turning point in high school. And it was nice in high school to have a best friend to be able to talk to and you know, we had this whole secret life together. Like we would go to debutante, we were debutante balls and to proms and to all kinds of dances with our dates. And then after, you know, midnight, we, we would ditch the dates and we would go downtown to the gay bars. And so it was a total double life I was leading. And my parents, <laughs> I don't know where they were. Because I was the youngest of eight kids, they were kind of checked out at that point. So well, I would come home at five in the morning and they didn't, they weren't even aware of it because um, I was making great, you know, really good grades in school. So, and then I went away to college and the same thing happened. I, I the, of course, the day, day one, I meet this guy on, on, the, on campus and we become really, we, we become best friends. And, and then we have like a few months later, we come out to each other. And at in high school and in college, I never thought homosexuality was a permanent condition for me. I just thought, this is just kind of what I'm feeling now, and eventually I'll grow out of this, and I'll marry a woman, have a family, but 
as Emily Dickinson says, the heart wants what it wants. So at that time, I just was like, okay, this is what I'm feeling, and so I'm going to go for this. And so it was, again, in college, it was nice to have a friend because I was still very much in the closet in college, and no one really knew except like a few people. So it was nice to have a friend in college that uh, I could talk to and we could share stuff with, and, and we would go, he and I would go to gay bars together as well. And then everything changed when we decided to move to Tokyo after college. So he, I was, I was accepted into law school and to dental school. I know it's a weird combination, but <laughs> it's a long story. But he was also accepted into law school. And we, neither of us really wanted to do that. So we were like, he said, why don't we move to Tokyo and spend a year in Japan and kind of figure things out. And I'm like, okay. So I guess Japan's like the place to go figure your life out. But we, so we moved to Tokyo and uh, that's when homosexual, homosexuality became my identity, which is a weird place for that to happen because Japan at that time in the 90s, it was, it was like 20 years behind the US in terms of social issues, like like homosexuality. So in in Japan, uh, homosexuality was so, so, so taboo. I mean, all the gay bars were underground. It was very, very, uh, it was was very kind of an honor-shame culture, and you could not be gay. uh, You could not be Japanese and gay. So, um, but what, what was weird is I felt so far away from home that I felt this kind of freedom in, in Tokyo. I had my little motor scooter that I bought there and just driving around the city all night. It was so much fun until I got hit by a truck. But <laughs> what, <laughs> I broke my collarbone. But so about eight months into our stay there, he, my roommate invited his friend to come, his friend from Texas to come stay with us. This guy, Adam. So Adam comes, stays with us for five days. And by the time, the, by the end of his stay, Adam, Adam and I had fallen in love, whatever that means. We, we uh, and it was the first time I had ever felt that strong romantic feeling. And, and then we got into a relationship, a two-year relationship. So that's when, that's when it, I was like, okay, this is who I am. This is never changing. It's immutable. I'm gay. I don't care who knows it. I'm telling my family. I'm telling my friends. Like, I, I was just like, this is it. I was just all in for it. And, and then, <clears throat> but my, actually, my, my sister wrote me a letter while I was in Tokyo, and she, she asked me if I was gay because she had had her suspicions for a while. And I wrote her this long letter back saying yes, and, and this is why, blah, blah, blah. This is, and I kind of gave her all the... Um, the information. And, and then at the end, I said, P.S., please don't tell mom and dad. I'll tell them when I get home. But of course, she gets the letter and immediately runs to my parents and tells them everything. So, I, which I was actually glad that she did that because I didn't have to do the heavy lifting. She did it for me. So when I got home to, at, after that year, I got home that Christmas and my, my, everyone in my family knew. And my parents knew, and my parents, again, were were strong, strong Christians, and everyone in my family believed homosexual behavior was a sin. So my parents' reaction was so lovely because the the night after I got into town, to Dallas, I, I remember I walked in the kitchen, and my mother was sitting at the kitchen table, and we were very, my mother and I were very, very close, and she started crying, and I knew why she was crying. And I said, Mom, what's wrong? And she said, I know you're homosexual and, and blah, blah, blah. And I said, Mom, don't worry about it. It's okay. I, and I just tried to allay her fears about it because it was, it was a terrifying time. It, it, back in 1992, three, like AIDS was a death sentence. So it was like a real, real uh, issue. And she was terrified of it. I was terrified of it. And so... That's what, you know, she was really afraid of that. And then, and then that was kind of like the end of it. You know, after that conversation, that was the, the end of that. The next day, my father comes up to me and he says, hey, Beck, 
did I, you know, do anything wrong as a father? Are you angry at me for X, Y, and Z? And I was like, no, dad, it's not your fault. This is just who I am. It's not a big deal. Turns out it actually probably was his fault. <laughs> it's a very distant father, you know, overbearing mother. Like, yeah, I don't know. Uh, it's, the jury's still out on that. But I don't, I'm not mad at him. I love him. Like, he's in heaven, praise God. And he was like an amazing example to my family who's all like saved, which is crazy. All 10 of us. Um, so so uh, then I decided to do a very stupid thing and move to Los Angeles. I, so I decided not to go to, to grad schools, and I moved to L.A. to pursue writing and acting, which I don't recommend to anyone. And, and when I got to L.A., I had this built-in group of friends already there because my best friends from high school uh, had gone to these Ivy League schools on the East Coast, and, and, they, and a bunch of their friends came out to L.A. to, you know, to make it in Hollywood and show business. And so I had this really fun group of smart, ambitious, hilarious people, and we all wanted the same things in life. We all, we're all on the same page, and we wanted three things. Number one, to make it big in Hollywood, and every, all of my friends were actors, directors, writers, producers. And they were, it was happening to them. Like every month, every week, every, it was crazy like watching my friends become like stars overnight. Like Minnie Driver was a very close friend and she was kind of, and no one really knew her as an actress. And then she did Good Will Hunting with Matt Damon. And she was suddenly like this famous actress. And, and Mariska Hargitay was kind of not well-known. She was Jane Mansfield's daughter, but... And then I drove her to her audition for Law & Order Special Victims Unit, and she got the part for 22 years. I think she owes me some royalties for that. <clears throat> um, and so I was... And my friend, like, my friends were directing movies that became huge hits, like uh, Doug Ly uh, Swingers, the movie Swingers. I was there when, when Doug Lyman, the director, we were at a coffee shop called Swingers. And he said, oh, I think I'm going to make a movie and call it Swingers. And we were like, oh, cool. And then the movie comes out and it's like this giant, huge hit. And so this was happening to all of my friends. And, and then we wanted, the second thing we wanted was to find true love. And so I was, so I, I cycled through a series of five serious, serious boyfriends, live-in boyfriends. And it was like, it was, it felt like they were so intense. It felt like I was married and divorced five times. I mean, that's how intense these relationships were. And each time I got into a relationship with a guy, I felt like, oh, this guy is going to, this is going to be the answer to everything. And this is, this guy is going to save me almost, almost like a Messiah kind of thing. Like this guy is going to save me. And then it wouldn't work out after two years. It was always a two, two year shelf life. That was kind of the, <laughs> That's how long the shelf life was. And after two years, and then I, so then I would go to the next guy, I would meet another guy and I think, oh, well, that last relationship didn't work out, but this next one, this one's really gonna work out and it's gonna be amazing and it's gonna solve all my problems. Um, and then, so I cycled through a lot of that boyfriends. And the third thing we all wanted was to have extraordinary experiences. Because we thought, you know, that's, this is what life is about. We're in Hollywood. We're young Hollywood people. Like, this is, we're having these amazing experiences. And so we were, in, we were going to movie premieres every week. To the, we're, we were going to all the award shows, the Oscars, the Grammys, the Golden Globes, the, uh, uh, the Emmys. Every, in all the after parties, the Vanity Fair party, the, the governor's ball after the Oscars, where I had dinner with Meryl Streep and Tom Hanks and all these people. And, and met, I met in the HBO parties and I met everyone and knew everyone and was friends with people. And, and I was, you know, I would go, to, one night I went to Prince's house where he performed a concert in his backyard for three hours for like 50 people. It was the crazy night. And, you know, I would go to Drew Barrymore's house and go swimming in her pool all the time and go to Paris Hilton's house and hang out. So I, I was having, I was just surrounded by shiny objects, like, right? And this really sustained me for a long, long time. And my friends, God was not, <laughs> my friends 
we never once mentioned the word God to each other because it was just assumed that God didn't exist. It was just clear. We didn't even have to say it. And so, but after a while, after years of this kind of activity, the law of diminishing returns starts to set in. And you're like, I was kind of like, is that all there is to a fire? Is that all there is? And I started to really kind of wonder about the meaning of life. And, you know, I would try to, I would look for it in different places, not just in relationships with guys, but art was my religion. So I would, whenever I was in New York, I'd go to New York and London a lot in Paris. I would, I would go to museums, like multiple museums a day. And that art was like, I was obsessed with it. It was my religion. I would go to art openings all the time in New York and, and around the and in Europe. And, um, and the other thing, I would, I would go to serious plays in New York and London all the time and, and on Broadway and the West End, plays by you know, brilliant playwrights like T- Tom Stoppard and T- uh, Harold Pinter, Tony Kushner, Eugene O'Neill, uh, Ibsen. Like I would, I would, and I would think, oh, these guys are so brilliant and talented. Like they're gonna, I'm gonna glean some sort of meaning of life from these plays. And I would go into the play so hopeful and it would get so close to something kind of resembling truth, but then it would just evaporate. And I would leave the the theater always frustrated by that. And so it all came to a head in Paris in uh, March of 2009. I was at Paris Fashion Week. I used to go to Fashion Weeks in New York and Paris all the time. And this, this year, in 2009, I had, you know, I had gone to a bunch of the runway shows and the shows have after parties. And I was at this one after party and I was, I was up on this kind of balcony with sitting with Rachel Zoe, who was this fashion girl and her husband, Roger. And everyone from the fashion world was, was there at the party. They were dancing. Kanye West was there. The people were drinking and dancing and you know, everyone was kind of like having the time of their lives, right? And I'm, suddenly I look out over the dance floor, I'm drinking champagne, and I just feel this overwhelming sense of emptiness, like utter emptiness. And I thought, I can't do this anymore. (laughs) Like, I've been doing this since high school, going to these fabulous parties, going, being invited to all these things this is not gonna sustain me for the rest of my life and I don't know what I'm gonna do. And again, God was not an option. And I thought, well, what's gonna happen to me? Am I gonna be put out to pasture in Palm Springs as an elderly gay man? Like, what, like what's, what are my options here? And so <laughs> I, uh, I went back, I, got, I ghosted the party, went back to my, the apartment I had rented in the Murray, and I was up all night in a panic about my future. And then I get back to LA a few days later. I get really busy with work again. And at that time, I was, I was a production designer, a set designer in the fashion world. So I did, I did production design for shoots for like, you know, big brands like YSL and Gucci and Nike and all these brands and for, for the cover of Vogue and Harper's Bazaar. And I worked with a lot of actresses and, and pop singers. And, um, and so I got really busy in that. I got busy with work again and kind of forgot about that night in Paris. And then six months later, as God would have it, I was at, um, so I was at this coffee shop with my best friend. My best friend and I had the same ritual. He was gay. We had the same ritual every weekend. We would go to brunch in Venice. And then we would drive across town to Beverly Hills or West Hollywood to have, to go shopping, which is gay church, brunch and shopping. That's literally gay church. Our temple was Barney's New York. And um, we, and then we would go have coffee at this place called Intelligentsia on the east side of LA in Silver Lake. And it was fun. We would hang out there all day because we knew a ton of people there and we had a lot of people, a lot of friends would come and go. And so we, it was a very social place. And so that Sunday we were there drinking, just innocently minding our business, drinking our cappuccinos. And we 
suddenly we look over and there's a table next to us with five young people at the table and there's five Bibles, physical Bibles on the table. And it was the first time I had seen a Bible in public in my life in LA. And so my friend is like, ask them what they're doing. And I'm like, no, I don't want to talk to them. And he kept kind of prodding me. And finally, it's like a Christian's fantasy come true. I turn around. I'm like, hey, are you guys Christians? What's, what's the gospel? I'm an atheist. <laughs> and um, so they were happy to, to indulge me. They were, so they said, yes, we're, we're evangelical Christians. We go to a church in Hollywood on sunset. And... Um, and, I, and we had this great conversation for like an hour. And then, of course, I get to the $64,000 question. And I said, well, what does your church believe about homosexuality? And they said, well, we believe it's a sin. And I just loved how like matter of fact they were. They were so blunt about it, which I pre- appreciate because I like honesty. Um, and so what was surprising about that moment was not their response, but my reaction because A year before that, 10 years before that, I would have been like, you guys are insane and I'm leaving now and you need therapy. But because of that night in Paris six months before, I was open to hearing a different narrative or a different story. And so, and I had this kind of flash of like, well, what if God does exist? I mean, there's a slim chance he does exist, right? And what if homosexual behavior is a sin? And what if I've built my entire life on a false foundation and I don't know it? That's a possibility. So they invited me to their church the following Sunday. And I said, look, I don't know if, because it would have been a betrayal to my people to go to this, because according to my friend group, evangelicals were the worst of the worst. They were the enemy. They were the worst kinds of Christians, right? Born again Christians, which is the only kind of Christian there is. You can't be a Christian with, unless you're born again. Um, but <laughs> so I, they gave me the address and I said, I'll think about it. And I had a whole week to, to mull it over. And, and the following Sunday rolls around and uh, I got out of bed and I was like, I guess I'm going to do this. And I got in my car and it felt like a Tesla. It felt like it just drove me to this auditorium <laughs> by itself. I had no control over it. And I get, it's a, it meets in a high school auditorium. And I, I walked in and I, at first I heard the Christian worship band was playing music, right? Christian music. And it was, I, I, <laughs> I immediately was like, oh, Christian music. I forgot that existed. And I kind of cringed. <laughs> And, but then I was like, wait, it's really beautiful, actually. And, and then I sat by myself in the fourth row on the aisle. I'll never forget. And the pastor comes out, and he's in the middle of a, ser- a series on Romans. He's been he's preaching through Romans for two years, right? So he's in, on Romans chapter 7 that day, and he starts preaching for an hour. And as the strangest thing starts to happen to me, as he's preaching, Every word that he's saying, every sentence he's saying is resonating as truth in my mind and my heart, and I don't know why. And I'm literally on the edge of my seat, riveted to the sermon. And I'm like, don't stop talking, like keep talking. And it was the first time in my life that I had heard and understood the gospel. And I was like, wait, this is the gospel? This is good news. And it turned, it turned everything I thought religion was on its head. And I was like, wow, like, this is amazing. And so at the, he finished his sermon. He said, you know, there's people on the sides of the auditorium if you want prayer for anything. And, and so I had this other moment of like, do I walk over to the side and get prayed for? If I do, it's kind of awkward. People are probably watching me, the ones who invited me here. And I was like, whatever, I'm here. So I walk up to this guy on the side of the church and I said, I don't know what I believe, but I'm here. And he laid hands on me when that was still legal in California. And he (laughs) prayed for me. (laughs) And I was like, I was thinking, why does this random straight dude love me so much? Um, And so I thanked him for his prayer. Went back to my seat. And that's when it all went down. So I sit down. And because I'm just kind of so freaked out by the sermon, by the music, by the prayer. And there's another 25 minutes of worship music. Everyone else is standing and singing. I sit down 
And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit just like crashes into me. Yeah, praise God. It was... It was like a road to Damascus moment. And in that moment, God revealed himself to me. And in my mind, God said, I'm God. I'll never forget this. He said, I'm God. Jesus is my son. Heaven is real. Hell is real. The Bible is true. Welcome to my kingdom. <laughs> and I, I just started, I just started bawling and bawl. I was, I was crying uncontrollably for the next 25 minutes. I was doubled over just crying and I was crying harder than I had ever cried in my life since I was an infant, but it made sense because I had just been born again in that moment. So I was a new infant in Christ. And I was crying over two things, over the conviction of sin, but also over the joy of meeting the king of the universe, Jesus. And it was like the, per the curtains had parted and I finally knew what the meaning of life was. It was like this, it's like, I finally knew where I came from, what I'm doing here and where I'm going. I know it was so clear in that moment. And so after the service, I collect myself, I get home somehow and uh, I get into bed to take a nap because I'm just so freaked out by the whole thing. And God's like, let me show you some more of my glory. <laughs> and I just felt like his presence so powerfully in bed. And I, jumped, I immediately burst into tears, jumped out of bed, And in the middle of my bedroom, I said, God, you have my whole life. I'm yours. I'm done. That's it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and I knew in that moment, I knew that, I knew that homosexuality, homosexual behavior was a sin. I knew that it was wrong. I knew that it was not who I was. I knew that being gay was not my identity. It was a false identity. I knew that dating guys was no longer part of my future, but I didn't care because I just met Jesus. And I'm like, I'm going with that guy. Good riddance to that old life. <clears throat> and that was September 20th, 2009. And I'm still in shock that, <laughs> that God had mercy, had grace on a wretch like me, that he had mercy on me and plucked me out of darkness and pulled me into his marvelous light. And I think of Paul, like I think of Philippians 3.8, Because over the years, because, you know, when I told all my friends, I lost a, a ton of friends, like all those friends. I lost a ton of friends. I lost my career in 2019 when my book came, came out. But I, it's like Paul, when he says, I count everything as lost. Everything is rubbish because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Like nothing else, everything else pales in comparison. So I want to turn to some, some questions now um, that I get a lot. And first of all, I want to address the born What, aren't you born, aren't people born gay? Like, didn't God create you gay? Like, how, why, how can you be responsible for that if you're born gay? Okay, so <clears throat> let's break it down. There are three main theories about why a person becomes same-sex attracted. Uh, there's a genetic predisposition theory. There's a uh, hormonal in utero theory. So when you're in, in your mother's, when you're in your mother's stomach. Um, <laughs> And then the third one is it's environmental, you know, a, a distant father, overbearing mother kind of thing. And, but the, the point is, it doesn't matter what, what the theory, what, what's true. It doesn't matter because it's, it's all moot because we're all born. In, not only are we born in sin, we're conceived in sin. So, and our, we be, are because of the fall, we are all, our mind, our body, our spirit is corrupted by sin. Even our genetic coding is corrupted. So if a scientist, if the New York Times had a headline, scientist discovers gay gene, I'd be like, so what? Like, of course, our genetic coding is corrupted. So all of us, every human, all of you, everyone is born with sinful, innate impulses. But that doesn't mean we act on those impulses. So whether you're, it doesn't matter. It's a red herring. If you're born gay or not, it doesn't matter. And God did not, God doesn't create gay people. God doesn't create people with homosexual uh, urges or, or homosexual desires. That's a result of the fall and the corruption of the fall. So, um, and the, the second thing I, I get a lot is, can you be gay and Christian? And now this is a multi-pronged answer because there's so many different uh, 
kind of factions in this. So there are, there are people like me who have been saved out of that life, but who still call themselves gay Christians, who, who still identify as gay, which is bizarre to me. They, they call themselves gay Christians or queer Christians. It's called side B theology. And to me, it's bizarre because why, we're a new creation in Christ. I'm a new creation in Christ. Why would I still identify with my old man? Why would I still, why would I still? It's like, it's like carrying around my binky or something. Why would I want to keep that? And also it's very, it's very um, extremely spiritually unhealthy because you're cutting off that part of you from sanct- being sanctified by the spirit. So it's like to hold on to that identity is, is bizarre to me. I would never call myself a gay Christian. I mean, do you call yourself a, a gossiping Christian or an adulterous Christian? No, you, you're a Christian. And so um, the other side of that is there are, of course, you know, you know, there's churches in the West that are gay churches or gay affirming churches. And it's like... <sighs> That's a, to me, you, that's a, biblically, that's a square circle. You can't, live, you can't live an unrepentant gay life, homosexual life, and be a Christian. It's, in, it's like it's an elderly baby. It's an impossibility. And, and so, and it's the, the, the difference is with this, issue, this particular sin issue, because the culture celebrates it so much and it's beca- it's gone from a sin to a sacrament in the last 50 years it's gone from a behavior to an identity so there are gay pride parades but there's no greed pride parades or tax collector pride parades right because it, so it's so it's it's such a strong identity so if you believe that homosexual behavior is right is good and even righteous and even holy in marriage then you're never going to repent of that and so without repentance, there's no salvation. And so that's, that's the danger of, of this particular sin because it is such a strong, strong identity in our culture. And then I often get, oh, and I just want to read a first, I just want to read First John, a couple of verses from First John regarding this because I think he says it well. First John 3, he says, no one who abides in Christ keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has, has either known him or seen him. And he goes on to say, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. And notice he, he's saying he, who makes a practice of sinning. So it's an ongoing, unrepentant uh, kind of concept. And then he says, finally, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. So yeah, you can't, there, there's no such thing as a gay Christian. It doesn't work. Um, it's just like being an unrepentant, you know, adulterous Christian for the rest of your life and just having, committing adultery forever and ever and, and thinking that you, that's an impossibility. So, and people often ask me about, especially when I, when I told my friends um, my, what happened to me, they, they were very concerned about me. They were like, well, you're not going to be able to have a partner? Like, you're, not, you're going to be alone for the rest of your life? Isn't that unfair? And I, I was like, well, first of all, I'm not alone. I have, I have a relationship with Jesus Christ, which is the best relationship I've been in ever, by the way. <laughs> and, um, I've, and I I've honestly, I've never... And plus, I have an amazing, the body of Christ is amazing. I mean, we're all spiritual brothers and sisters. And so, and I've never felt for a moment, for the last 13 and a half years, I've never felt cheated out of anything. I've never felt like, oh, woe is me. My life is hard. I have to be single and celibate. I never once felt that. I've just been like, how in the world did God put me in his kingdom. Like, this is amazing. Like, I feel nothing but gratitude. And um, I'm in shock and, 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 just, and just awe, shock and awe that God had mercy on me. And, you know, what, what's unfair is that Jesus had to be crucified and, and tortured for my sin. That's unfair. 
my life is not unfair. <laughs> and so I, I honestly don't get, because there, there's, there's this whole idea of, in, in that, that what I was talking about earlier, side B theology, there's this idea that they proffered called sexual minority. So they consider themselves sexual minorities, which is not a biblical category. There's only sexual sin. Like there's no such thing as sexual minority in the Bible. And so, uh, I, and it's this, it's this mentality of kind of this victim mentality of like, I'm a sexual minority. I need special kind of attention because I, I, I struggle with this particular sin. It's like, yeah, everyone struggles with sin. We all have indwelling sin that we struggle with. Welcome to the club. Like, so there's no special status you get as a sexual minority, quote unquote. And so, yeah, I, I've, I've never felt that kind of, vic- and I, I'm just like, we're, we're not victims, we're victors in Christ. What are you talking about? Like, this is crazy. So, um, and then I just want to talk about uh, what, how, my, how my mother and some family members, how, what they did, because I, this is a big question. Like, what do you do as a parent, as a sibling, with someone who's come out or who's struggling with this or who's gay or blah, blah, blah. How, what do you do? So I, I just want to tell you a couple stories of, of what happened with uh, my mother. So my mother, remember, she, we had that one interaction about it where we, she was crying at the kitchen table when I got back from Tokyo. And then we never spoke of it again. She never once mentioned it again. My father never once mentioned it again. Um, and my mother did something much more dangerous and powerful. She prayed for 20 years. And uh, two months ago, my sister-in-law found this letter. I had no idea my mother was even doing this, but my sister-in-law found a letter in a, bo- in a box and sent it to me. And it's a, it's a typed letter that my mother wrote to God. And it says, the title of it is A Prayer for Beckett. And I was so shocked when I saw, I was, I was bawling when I saw this letter. I was like, wow. Because I couldn't believe my mother was so, she knew, and my mother knew that this was a spiritual battle. She knew that it wasn't, it wasn't about her trying to manipulate me and kind of fix me. It, she had to go to the throne room of God. And, and this is where the battle is won. And so she the, the first prayer point on this is she says, she wrote, deal aggressively with the enemy, come against him in the all-powerful name of the Lord Jesus Christ and with the sword of the spirit, the word of God. So she knew it was a spiritual battle. And Paul says, we do not wrestle with flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And it's amazing, like... <laughs> She even prayed, which God answered, which is bizarre, which is amazing. And I, when I read this, I mean, I was just like, wow. She, one of her prayer, one of the points is protect Beckett from AIDS. I was like, what? And God did over, I mean, after 20 years of crazy stuff going on, God protected me from that. And he answered this prayer. Um, Protect him from AIDS. Uh, he said, one of the prayer points, bring a girl into his path. I love that. <laughs> um, that's, that has yet to happen, but I mean, I, I'm open to it. Um, but my, my sister-in-law was, was very similar in that she, we would, uh, every time I would go home to Dallas for the holiday, she would call me she was an evangelical Christian. She would call me and want to get together for coffee. And I was always kind of surprised by this. Like, why does she want to hang out with me? She knows I'm gay. She's like a hardcore Christian. Why, is she, why does she want to hang out with me? But we would have the best time. She would talk about God. I would talk about guys. And she never, she never like said, hey, Beckett, you know, uh, you're still sinning, right? Leviticus 18, let me just read it to you. No, she, what she did was, loved me generously, and she prayed this 
this verse over me for many, many years, Acts 26, 18. This is when Paul's in front of King Agrippa and he's telling the king, king what God has sent him to do to preach to the Gentiles. And he says, this is the verse he prayed over me. To open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. And uh, yeah, guess what? God answered that prayer. God answered my family's prayers. I mean, yeah. So the thing is, you know, my friend Rosario Butterfield, she says, she, I love this advice because she says, you know, when a child comes out to you or, 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 or sibling or family member, stay connected to that person as much as you can, love them as much as you can, but never never um, become indoctrinated by the, the, the LGBTQ ideology. Don't, don't give up your convictions on this just because it's your child. I know, it's, I know that's a temptation to do that, to cave to that because it is your child and you love them and you want, but if you love them, I'm so glad my parents never caved to anything because if they had, they would be sending me down a road of destruction. So they loved me too much to cave to that. Um, and I just love that my, my family members and my parents and, and sibling, they just had so much patience, patience with me and compassion for me over the years. And, um, I just want to close with, with a couple final thoughts and a verse, but, um, this is nothing new. Satan has been twisting God's word in the garden since the beginning. Did, did God really say did he really say that? And he's doing that with this, this issue this, you know, today. He's like, do, well, the Bible, you know, who knows? Like these verses, these clobber passages, like they, did God really say that homosexual behavior is a sin? I mean, that's, this is just a cultural thing. No, the Bible is so clear on it. From Genesis to Revelation, the Bible is clear about sexuality. It's clear about God's design for what marriage is between a man and a woman. It's so clear and... There's no, there's no confusion. And, and so when people try to use those arguments, just, just know that they're false. <laughs> they're, not, they're not true arguments. And, um, and this is one thing I say to, and I think there are a lot of young people in here tonight. One thing I, I say to young people is the world, especially now, as you know, TikTokers, the world is going to lie to you for the rest of your natural life. And you can either believe the world, and which leads to destruction, or you can believe the word, which leads to life. Those are the, those are the two. Yeah, those are the two options. And, um, and I, I, now I can't find the verse I was going to close with. Um, but yeah, I, well, I can't find it now. It's second Timothy when he, when he just says, you know, the time is coming when people will have itching ears and will want to, you know, accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their passions. And that's what's happening now. So I just, I just, yeah, just be aware of that. We live in a specific time and place and culture in history 30 years ago, 40 years ago, this wasn't a thing. In high school, my high school friends unanimously, in the boys' school and the girls' school, unanimously believed that homosexual, homosexuality was wrong. Some of those same people today are gay, like allies to, to like they, put, they post flags on their social media, gay, you know, rainbow flags. And it's like, well, what's happened? Has God's word changed? No. It's like, no, but 30 years of indoctrination has happened. And that's why. And so just be aware of that. So let's just close in, in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for tonight. Thank you for your amazing mercy, your grace, your salvation, God. It's, it's just incredible, Lord. And I just pray for anyone here who's struggling with this particular issue Lord, I pray that you would have so much grace on their lives, so much mercy, because it is, it's not an easy road to, to uh, it's not an easy road, God. And 
this particular sin issue, for whatever reason, is difficult. It's very difficult. And so I pray, Lord, that you would have so much mercy and grace on anyone struggling with this. I pray that you would have give comfort by your spirit to those family members who are dealing with this and with someone in their family, God. And I, I just pray for salvation, Lord. I pray that you would just bring so much salvation in this area, in, in this world, God. So we just love you, Lord. We thank you for everything you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys.